morning ladies and gents. You join me here out in a lovely coniferous forest. It's a nice fresh wind today. And today I'm gonna to be setting up a basic tarp shelter. I'm gonna use my tarp and fold it underneath to get a ground sheet as well. And I've also brought with me a few of my dad's tools, some of which are over 100 years old, which is gonna be great fun. Sit back, relax guys, and I hope you enjoy this video. So as you can see, it's a fairly dense woodland. Uh, this side is the coniferous side, and that side over there is the deciduous side. All Scots pine trees around here. I've got to be careful of uh, dead branches and any trees and widow makers that are looking like they're going to fall. But where I am here is a nice kind of opening. I had a look up, there's no overhanging branches. And I found two trees, uh, this one here and this one here when I go, where I'm going to string the tarp up. It's the backpack I've got. It's called the Wee Sport Woodcraft. I've got a sleeping bag underneath here. My tarp and everything else that I need for the overnighter is in the main compartment. And I've got water and things like that in the side pockets. This is what I keep my tarp in. Uh, so this is a three by three meter DD tarp. I'll pop a link in the description. Um, I got my one on Amazon just because it's easily available. I keep it in this stuff sack though, this dry bag. And on the very top, I keep my ridge line. So it's the first thing I need to get to, to get the tarp up, I need the ridge line. So this is the, the paracord basically for the ridge line, which I keep nice and easy on the top and then I can get the rest out once it's tied. For one end of the ridge line of the paracord I've tied, I've tied a simple loop and all I do with this is with a thin stick go round the tree and then push the remaining your, your working end of the paracord through there which creates a sort of secondary loop. I slide the stick up and then this acts as like a ratchet it helps me to cinch it down and then I can pull it tight and the great thing is is once it's cinched tight I can let go and that tension's still pretty much there, so I can feed this, this rope now to the other tree. You might be wondering why this ridge line is so low down, and that's because the tarp setup I'm doing today is what I like to call a low profile or stealth tarp, and it's very low, it's about, gonna be about waist height. It's kind of a long, low, thin tarp, and I just like it because, you know, it's just fairly easy to set up. It's very sheltered, we've got forecasts of all sorts of weather coming. I don't, don't know what's gonna happen, but we've got meant to be about minus three tonight, there's meant to be rain tomorrow, um, all sorts of weather. Typical England, it changes all the time. So what I like to do with this ridge line is set it up about pocket to waist high, about here. That's just my way of measuring that I know the bottom of the tarp is gonna reach the ground. So from here, I'm gonna run the ridge line now across to the other tree and then show you the knot that I used there. Before I tie the knot at the other tree, I need to be able to feed that ridge line through the loops in the tarp. So ladies and gents, this is a three by three meter tarp. So it is a square, three meters, three meters, loads of tie out points on this tarp, that's why I've got it. It makes it very easy to do loads of different combinations of setups. On each end I've tied about 10 meters worth of paracord in the four corners. This is just to help tie out, although I won't necessarily need these for this setup. Tarp Shelters 101. By the way, if you want to know um, different bushcraft setups for tarps, I've got a video called Five, five Tarp Setups or something for bushcraft. Uh, I'll pop a link again in the video description to that. So there are four tie out points on this tarp and all I'm going to do with the ridge line here is put it through the middle tie out points. I'll explain why in the next step. Find the middle point, just here. Pull the other end of the ridge line through. Make sure it doesn't twist up. I have a fairly long ridge line. At this point, I can see by tensioning the ridge line, how high the tarp is. So that's pretty high. I might even want it a little bit lower than that. So I'll come back over to the ridge where it's tied here and just lower it a tiny bit over here. So I've now got my other end of the tarp here. And this knot is called a, a well, I call it a taut tarp hitch. There's different names for it, but this is how I do it. So there's the main ridge line. 
with the top middle point tied out around the tree check everything's the right height now at this point now is when you want to check it's all level if you need to raise it raise it up if you need to lower it then lower it pull it tight wrap it back on itself and this is the part that's going to cinch it all tight like that it's like a half hitch pull it really tight this is where you need to keep that tension up come back around at this point i can drop this sort of ball of mess here because i don't need all that so i make the triangle here make a little triangle shape and then this side there's a u shape once i've pulled that tension i just keep my thumb there and pull the remaining end through that u put it away that's not going to lock it that can still slip so i've got this loop here got the remaining tag end here pull it through this loop again keep everything tight pull it really tight cinch it all down and what's, what that's done is create a quick release loop here which I can adjust and just pull down hard on that and that will loosen the whole tarp setup. But I don't want this loop slipping now so I'm going to put a stick through it, pull this tag end sort of nice and tight and that just prevents the quick release loop from slipping. So if I wanted to undo it now I just pull the stick out and pull there and we're done. You may notice along my ridge line I have a couple of loops. There's one there and there's one just, just up there as well. Two, two of these and they're called prussic loops. Prussic knot is really easy to tie. All you do is tie a loop. I've just done a sort of overhand knot there. Doubled the, doubled the paracord over, tied an overhand knot. That's what it looks like. So to tie this knot, all I do with the loop is go put this the knot through the loop, like so, and you can, you can pull it down a bit just to give you a bit more to work with. Keep that loop there again, put the knot through again, and just make sure Everything is even like that, and then you can pull it tight. And when you pull it correctly, it, it looks like that, which is like a monkey's fist, they call it. Like that, it's like a fist. And this is super tight. When you pull this at an angle now, if I zoom back a bit, when you pull this at an angle, really, look, I'm pulling really tight on that. That knot's not moving. It's the same with this way. Pull it really tight, not moving. But hold the knot itself, so loosen it a bit, hold the knot itself, and you can slide it. So it's like an adjustable knot, the prussic knot. So now I've got the middle point tied, tied up, I'm going to use the next loop along and the same with that side to tie to this prussic knot with a stick. And to do that I simply, there's different ways of doing this, you can put the paracord through it or you can put the tarp through it like this. I like to do it by the paracord going through that loop, back on itself and then plopping a stick just through that gap so it's like hitching on itself and that now is locked off to the tarp. So I can pull this tight and it pulls the tarp tight. You do the same the other side. Now I could just pin the sides down here and here and I'd be away, but I've got all this tarp at the back that's to waste. So I can fold that on itself and create my own ground sheet inside here.
Pardon. Stealth tarp or low profile tarp all from a 3 by 3 meter and as you can see loads of plenty of space for the rain to run off it's all nice and tight so it shouldn't sag the ground sheet meets up to the edges you can get a bit of a draft in there but it's easily solvable by just lifting this up a bit and there's loads of space it's surprising although it's so low down there's so much space in there people do ask me uh, if it rains you're going to get wet the ground sheet well what you can do is just tuck this in a bit tuck this in further back like that and lay further in and that way the rain will hit out here and not on your actual you know ground sheet itself not good for sitting up in but just for going to bed and lying down loads of room and if you're six foot something there would be room because I'm only five foot something and I've got a good couple of feet this side so you should be fine I've slept in this many a time you do get a little bit of condensation with it being fairly close to your face but if you can put up with that job done now I do get the question as well what happens if the wind direction changes and comes is coming straight into this tarp setup that's very easy to change really especially if you're in a dense woodland like this you just unpeg the back the back pegs of the tarp undo one of the ridge line and then just pivot that on that main leave one end of the ridge line there and you can pivot your shelter around just to, to wherever you want really you don't have to thread all this back through the tie out points here but obviously that applies to a fairly dense woodland where there's loads of trees around this is winter got the four season bag my mountain warehouse everest down one i'm not gonna unravel that yet i don't really need it just yet just to make sure you don't lose your stuff sack just clip it on the ridge line there easily accessible and you don't lose it Trust me, I've lost these before from just tossing them on the floor. Keep everything nearby and visible. So these are the tools that I've brought with me on this trip. I've got a small hatchet. Again, these are all my dad's. Uh, this hatchet, we believe, is the one that's over 100 years old. It is, I mean, it's pretty ancient. Look at the eye on it. It's gonna be quite dangerous to use this as well. I'm very aware of that. You know, that, that could shift a fair a fair amount, so I've got to be really careful with this. But she's an old blade. Look how pitted it is. We put it on the grinder a couple of days ago, but I'm going to kind of refine that edge a bit out here in the field on a sharpening stone. Got a lot of bits of rust all over it here. It's very pitted. I've been trying to look for a hallmark, but I can't find one. So I don't know, maybe you guys might know more about uh, this sort of, you know, I, I wonder if this is like a carpenter's hatchet or something like that or, you know, like a, a roofer's hatchet I'm not too sure at all It's a fairly light blade, I'd say it's not much more than a pound, this head um, You know, so it's sort of flat, fat uh, Very, very thin up here So it's not, it's not a huge sort of splitting hatchet, it's more for light work Maybe kindling and things like that But it is old, lovely old handle, probably hickory I'm guessing I'm not too sure Look at that wood. That is lovely. Old school. Gonna use this today. And then the next one is a bill hook. This is my dad's bill hook, which we have used in recent videos. Um, this one's not as old, obviously, as the the hatcher here. This is the old one. Uh, but this bill hook is um, we've used regularly, and dad dad likes using it. And it does actually have a a sort of hallmark here. Something sever quick. Maybe I need to do a bit of research. You guys, or you guys might know, sever quick. Something sever quick. I'm not sure what or who. Again, we've had this on the grinder a few days ago, but I'm going to try and sharpen this out in the field as well. This is more used for cutting down uh, crops and things like that by hand and just general beating through the bush over in Australia. That sort of thing. And then this one is, you guys should remember this is Dad's knife. Uh, it's got the is it the Fleur de Lis or something? Logo emblem here. I've had people say that this might be a Hitler youth knife. Or it's the same as a Hitler youth knife, but it's the scouts then adopted it. It's a Bowie knife. 
Uh, it comes with a little sheath here, pretty old and battered. Nice metal uh, protector there at the end of the sheath. This is the blade. You can see that classic bowy shape uh, with a nice finger guard there. Do you know what? It feels really comfortable in the hand. And this says here, Whitby, made in Collingen, Collingen, original bowie knife, super hollow ground. Dad's obviously double bevel, Dad's put a micro bevel on this. I don't know, we'll put it to the use, see what it does. And then finally I bought one of Dad's, if you can read this. It is Norton Abrasive, Norton Abrasive's oil stone, made in England. Norton Grinding Wheel Company Limited, Pike, it says there, Pike, I know that word well. But this is a pretty old oil stone of Dad's. He's used it. I think it's a combination stone. Yeah, it's a combination stone. So you've got a, a coarse side and a smoother side. Anyway, we'll put that to the test and try and sharpen some of the old tools on it. Going to use the, the oil stone first. Really, this should be on a flat surface. And I shouldn't be using it on the ground directly. I'm just going to use this to do the knife. And lift up this hand as I'm doing it, just to get that tip sharpened. Do about 10 strokes that way, 10 towards me. pretty sharp. Another way of doing this is you can uh, pick up the stone itself and that way you can look at the bevel of the knife to check it's exactly touching the stone all the time and just cut towards you. This can be you know helpful for those of you who are who go by a little bit more of confidence when doing it and I'm happy to have that micro bevel if anything I want that micro bevel. I'm just looking for the flex in the blade now. So let's test it. I think it's as, as sharp as I can kind of get it out in the field. It's kind of cool using old gear to, you know, like vintagey gear. Get back in touch with the old days. Don't forget what those guys did for us. And how much better tools are nowadays, really. You know, how much more efficient they are. Makes you have a lot of respect for the older days and the older gear. Although knives, it doesn't really and apply to except better steels. That's good, I'm impressed with that. I think I've improved it from dad's sharpening. No offense dad. Those tiny curls really well. Look at that. So later on, I'm gonna light a fire. I might try and light one with the uh, a ferro rod and this. But I might go a bit more old school as well. It's all about the vintage on this trip. But looking forward to using the knife more later. Vintage gear. So the bill hook's slightly different because I'm going to have to work on, I can't sort of slide across it like I do with the knife. So I'm going to have to work on one specific area of the bevel each time. Do about 12 or 13 that side. Whoa, God, you know what? That's pretty sharp already. And I'm gonna move up slightly a bit here. Key is to keep that angle right. I'm not doing this well in the sense that this is on the, the floor, which is not a level platform at all. It's soft, it's spongy. It's probably gonna put the bevel off a bit of the blade. And I've not put oil on the oil stone because I didn't bring any. So it's all against me really, but you've got to do with what you got. And they certainly did in the old days. That's pretty sharp. That's pretty sharp. I think uh, I think that should be fine. I'm going to do the axe slightly differently. I usually use the sharpening puck, the Gransford sharpening puck, which is a small disc that you rotate. Obviously, this is about vintage gear and trying to use old school gear where possible. So I'm just looking along the bevel like that, and I can see where we put the grind on. 
just to get a bit of a microbe sort of bevel there but it's all there's loads of burrs and things like that and it's, it's certainly not sort of sharp enough yet so I'm just going to use the coarse side of the stone and there's different ways you can do this you can do it by just rubbing against it that way I can see the bevel already so I'm going to close my left eye because I'm doing the right hand side of the blade don't need to see the left and you can just curve off like that that's probably the, one of the better ways and I could still use the stone like this like I do with the puck because at the end of the day a stone's a stone the puck and this you know yes they're different shape but they still do the same job Well, I just went to go find a source of good firewood. We had a lovely deluge of rain. We had a bit of a downpour. So let's go check out the tarp shelter. Whoop, nearly tripped. I had to flip the uh, ground sheet back a bit. You can see, starting to sort of puddle a little bit, but nothing too bad. It was pretty torrential rain, but I'm quite, uh, I flicked that back. So all in here, we're nice, we're nice and dry in here. And that is why we flicked the ground sheet back. But yes, that will probably sag over time. I can restake that out, retighten it. Other than that, it's all fun and games. So I found this dead birch, this small dead birch here, little sort of sapling. It's definitely dead because you can see it's snapped off at the top. I'm gonna use this opportunity to give the old bill hook a go. See if I can chop this down with a bill hook. Around about down here probably. It's still solid enough for firewood. She certainly works. <laughs> Old school. About four or five cuts. And a little bit rotten, but that'll certainly burn. Satisfying using all the tools. So whilst the bill hook does cut down small trees, it's not very practical, it's not designed for that. So rather than blunt it and just ruin it on that, I might use it on some kindling in a bit. But I'm gonna have a go with a little hatchet if I can find it. And that's over here. Now I've got to be really wary of this because an eye like that is is dangerous, so don't do this at home kids. But let's find a little, I don't want to, again, hatchet is not really designed for chopping down trees. It's designed for splitting small pieces of wood and lighter work. But it's nice to be able to know what it can do. So I'm just looking now for some small, a small dead pine tree with no needles on it, like this one. This little one here. If you can see that, this little one here has no needles at the top, it is dead. Oh, even better. Broke lower than I expected. As far as working on, but about the base is quite rotten, so it shows that it's dead anyway.
I'm going to stop using the hatchet because although I'm enjoying using vintage gear, this has now gone dangerous. Can you see that upward slant of the hatchet? And I don't know if you can see this, but there's been movement here. That that sort of uh, paler area of the wood is where the axe eye was was covering. It's now not, which means this is now becoming dangerous. And I'm not stupid enough to carry on. And if you look, I can probably there move it. So that's that's coming loose. I don't want to put injured myself, and I also don't want to ruin my dad's hatchet. We're going to probably rehandle this one as a project anyway. The head itself is fine. I might use it for just light work, but this is now becoming dangerous. I have brought a saw with me, so I'm probably going to saw up some of that wood. I didn't bring an old saw. This is the only old tools we had. But safety first. So it's still raining a bit, but I'm getting roasting. So I'm gonna take my, this is like a three in one jacket. Rain jacket, fleece underneath, it's too hot. Underneath, just so you know, I've got a wool shirt. <clears throat> this is just a wool, standard wool shirt. Then underneath that, I've got a t-shirt. Underneath that, I've got a merino wool base layer. <clears throat> so that's my upper half, lower half. I've got merino wool thermal leggings, obviously boxer shorts or, or uh, underwear as such first. Merino wool leggings and then these are just Pinewood Lapland uh, trousers, bush trousers. These are not waterproof by the way, just in case you're wondering. I really need to get this fire going soon because it's going to get dark. I don't really want to be collecting wood in the dark. So I've fashioned that knife onto the belt onto, using the belt loop. It's got a little clip here. Uh, it is slightly wobbly, the sheath, I think I can see Dad's done a bit of DIY where it's cut into the sheath. But I'm going to use this now because it's raining so much today. Everything is soaked, all the wood is completely soaked. Um, I'm going to do fire <clears throat> with, a, with some birch bark. Well, I'm looking for the birch bark that's got the whitest bark really because that's got the most resin content in. So you can see this bark here, although the tree, look how rotten this is. It's like completely rotten out, the inside of the tree, but the bark on the silver birch is usually the last thing that lives, which is great. Probably the best, one of the best natural life fire lighting materials. So I'm gonna, well that's, that's useful, but this inside stuff, it's not gonna burn on its own. I can get a flame on the outside, but I need to be able to kind of crack it and either get to the lighter stuff inside or I'm gonna have to try and find some grass. That's what I need to do ideally, that is just expose that, get to that layer if I can, by just breaking this, the mud layer off. That's that mud layer is the layer that's not gonna burn at all. So it's a, it's a long process, but we've got so much rain at the moment. It's unreal. I mean, it's nothing unusual for England, but I need that thin layer there. That stuff's gonna burn well. So I need a, quite a bit of that. I also need like a fireboard, a hearth board, which I could probably get from that piece there maybe because that's a bit bigger. Long pro, everything in winter and in the rain is much slower. Got to allow that time. It's not lose at all. It's so rotten inside. However, <sighs> this is a good fire board. Oh, that's a 
good bit. Right, that's a good bit to get. That's a good fireboard there to get a good dust pile for this fire. Now, if I can get some. Right, look at. See, that's useless that side. I've got to try and get that mud layer off. Nice and red, resinous, nice and white on the other side. That is what you want. Here we go. Even this stuff is soaked. <clears throat> Absolutely drenched. It's gonna be a difficult, difficult day today, just wet. It's soaking wet, look at it. Could be a struggle. So what I'm going to do is try and go for the finest twigs possible for this beginning bit because it's going to take a while to get it burnt and I need really spindly twigs for it. That's trying to go for ones that are high up off the ground because these are going to be the most the ones that are most dry. Anything that's lying on the ground just leave. No point it's going to be so wet. Even all this stuff is soaked. Trying to do some big feather sticks, I think. Just to try, try and get this fire going. So I've got this big piece of bark here, birch bark, and I did this in a video recently with Alex Steele. You guys would have seen me do that. I'm trying to scrape through the outer layer of bark to get through to this nice resinous part here. Maybe you can't see that because, you guys see that? That's the part I want to get to because they're the pieces that will ignite in this ridiculous rain that we've had suddenly. Downpour. Now I'm going to get a pretty big dust pile going today because I'm not going to have many chances at lighting this fire so I want to get it right. Just crushing them up a bit. I've got, I don't know if you can see, you can't see at the edge of the screen there, I've got some uh, twigs which are completely soaked as well. I tell you, fire lighting in the rain is not easy. <clears throat> and I've also got some curls, this is the best I could do. Loads of loads of curls here from using this. I've got my normal fire still here, and the issue I have with this knife, some of you may have guessed already, it doesn't have a straight right angled 90 degree spine here. If you look, it's slightly curved here, it's rounded, it's not sharp 90 degrees. Which means that when on the end of a ferro, look, it doesn't throw any sparks at all. However, upon closer inspection, this end, this part right here, as it goes to the drop point of the knife, if I try and focus for you, this part does have a 90 degree spine. I can even feel that right angle there. So I'm guessing this part should be able to throw some sparks off. Let me demo in the air. So this part, I'm pushing down really hard and I'm getting little sparks. Then I'm gonna to move to this part of the knife up here. And with a bit of luck, he says, oh, there we go. Proper sparks. So, without further ado, let's give it a go. This is basically like a one light fire, one fire chance. Let's get a brace back there. Come on, son. Come on. Come on. Yes, 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 yes.
gonna, I'm going to keep that dust pile there. Because I want it there. And then, get all this bark burnt. It's so wet. So wet. Try and get some of these curls lit. The difficult part because these are. Soaking wet. I did actually split some wood down earlier with the old Bowie as well. But because it was peeing down with the rain, I didn't film it. I really hope this works. We might be alright. <clears throat> it's a wet one, but fire's going. Get some more firewood, I think. So as you can tell, it's now raining. Delightful English weather, don't you love it? But the fire's going, which is good. But I do need to go and collect some more firewood. Get that done quick, it's gonna get dark in about half an hour, I'd say. We're a little bit later now for when it gets dark, which is nice, get the extra kind of hour. But it's middle of February, so it's gonna get dark still quite early. <sighs> yep, let's get some firewood. Mixture of rice, peas, a bit of carrot, I think, all sorts. Oh. There's probably far too much water in this, but it doesn't matter. I'm too hungry to care. Right in that. Oh, Ooh, it's hot. Camp set up. Need to t tighten the uh, tarp again in a minute because of all that rain we've had. Fire's going well and truly properly now. Uh, starting to get a little bit darker, but. Hanging my backpack here 
on this uh, protruding branch. You know they say you got to pack your backpack properly, got to get all the gear at the right height of the backpack and where you want it. Well, I go for priorities at the top. Yes, I believe this is from a subscriber called Mitchell. I think it's Mitchell. I hope I've got that right. Sorry if I haven't. Who sent me this? I opened it in the cabin. Guns and knives. Guns, knives, and beer is his. I guess his company. And it came in this cool little, this protective case. And the beer today is. Da, 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 da. Never had this. It's from across the pond. It is Renegade. The Renegade Brewery Company. Endpoint E3 or Endpoint Triple India Pale Ale. I am looking forward to trying this. It's 11%. Woo! Offensively delicious. I like that. Light beer drinker put this can down. From Denver, Colorado. Shout out to all the guys over in the US. Ooh, she's fruity. Oh, that's killer. That is killer. That's awesome. So citrusy. I approve. Thank you. We are done. Rice is ready. Beer, rice, fire, woods, shelter. I love my life. I'm very lucky, very fortunate. Thanks to you guys. You're helping make this all happen. I really do appreciate it. Oh, she's hot. <sighs> Carbohydrates. Get them in, you kids. So, not much. Uh, the light's going to go in about 10 minutes. I did bring a sort of uh, head torch but I didn't bring my camera light which is stupid of me so there won't be too much night filming but that's probably okay for you guys because it would have just been me waffling on drinking beer oh she's hot I'm burning my knees um the rain stopped which is nice that's why I've taken the jacket off because obviously the wool this would just get completely soaked and probably stay wet for a long time. So generally in my videos, if you're seeing me wearing this, that means the rain stopped. But it's been persistent all day. Since that weird downpour that I had, um, it must have changed in the video from like, I remember coming going out to get to look for some good firewood and then it just changed it. Tipped it down, I had to keep the camera dry for a bit. And now everything's just soaked. But it's okay because this is going and will do. It is, it's not freezing, so I think I'll be okay tonight. You know, if the fire burns out, I've got a four season sleeping bag. I'm not going to freeze to death. I think I should be fine. So I don't really mind if it goes out, but I will get some firewood to try and last it as long as possible through the night. Life is so good right now. I'm hoping it's good for you guys. I'm 
can't believe how quick everything goes on YouTube, like how quick you can grow, you know, the subscribers are doing, my subscribers are growing really fast, which is awesome, and I'm very grateful for that. I did that awesome collaboration with Alex still, which hopefully those of you who missed the video, that's gone up the one just before this one that's already up on my channel, which was awesome. I took Alex to the bushcraft camp out here, and that was really cool, really good fun. Um, he's a great guy. He's a really great guy. I can't believe how knowledgeable he is for 20. He's 20 years old. Like He's incredibly knowledgeable, very nice guy, really comes across exactly as he is in his videos. This is exactly how he is in real life. And a really good teacher. We made that awesome bushcraft knife together. So Alec, if you're watching, thanks man. Really appreciate it. That was such a cool collab. You guys seem to really like that as well. Learning a bit of blacksmithing. I'll pop some links in the description or up here somewhere if you want to watch the bushcraft knife I made and the, uh, the blacksmith projects that I've done with Alec. <sighs> so there is a chance uh, I get a lot of emails about meeting up with subscribers and it's a it's a very big thing to organize but there is a chance that we might be able to have an opportunity to be able to meet up and do a, a sort of subscriber meet which would be really cool but it's going to be um, I'm not gonna I won't know in this video yet I'm speaking to someone about it and hopefully there'll be something coming up in a video soon about uh, just meeting up you know just Having a good catch up with some of you guys, it'd be great to meet some of you. I read the comments. I know some of you from, some of you guys comment so much, I know you by person, which is awesome because you comment in every video. Great to see, really good to see. I've got another couple of uh, longer trips planned. One is to the coast. I've got a coastal one coming up and I've got Another mountain one, going up to the mountains again, which I didn't, which I did last summer, but I didn't do in the winter. So I've got like a late winter mountain one, which should be cool. And yeah, there's some good, good stuff coming up. Really good stuff coming up. This is amazing, man. I'm very lucky. Well, we're dark now, people. Sleeping bag is in the tarp. Fire's going well. Gonna hop in. Well, next time. <laughs> Can't believe I forgot mine. <laughs> Can't believe I forgot my blimmin' camera light. Sorry, guys. <laughs> anyway, it's now about 9.30. I am shattered, if I'm honest. Oh, um, I've obviously got some breakfast and stuff planned fire's going well it's a lovely evening it's so still there's no no rain which is nice I'll probably get some in the night um, I'm hoping the shelter should be fine I'm gonna tuck the tarp can you guys even no you can't even see sorry I'm gonna tuck the tarp like back there a bit more tuck this this ground sheet area back a bit just in case it does rain which is fairly typical for England But it's nice, it's peaceful, it's just awesome out here in the woods. I love it, I absolutely love it. I'm actually looking forward to breakfast already. So guys, without further ado, if you're sticking by already, I really appreciate it if you're still watching. Tomorrow morning we've got some good brekkie to cook up. And might have a wander through the woods and see what I can find and things. And just enjoy the day. So I'll see you in the morning. Morning guys. It was a little bit of a wet night. I didn't get too wet myself, but the tarp was quite noisy on the tarp. Uh, which also means the fire's now completely gone out. And there's some uh, pretty big coals here as well. Unfortunately, this, the, it didn't get hot enough for me to relight it from a coal this morning, but I need to get one on because I want some breakfast. Oh, another damp morning in England. What a surprise. <laughs>
Okay, I went and split some wood. Found some drier wood. And uh, split it up with the bill hook. Um, let's get a little raft going. Fire uh, I've also got some really thin stuff that I've split here, battened with the knife. And then I've got twigs over here. But I'm just gonna make a slightly different fire. So, just went to collect some dry grass. Well, I say dry, as dry as it gets. Got to put it in the cargo pouch. And whilst it's good like this, I'd rather rough it up a bit, break up the fibres, expose the, the drier fibres within the grass. Because today we're going to try and keep with the traditional, like I'm using sort of traditional tools, going to do a bit more of a traditional firelight and use um, flint and steel which again, you've seen recently on the channel if you've been watching. So, <clears throat> what I'm gonna do is just break these fibers up. You can see they're quite thick at the moment. Remember that, what that looks like, because now I'm gonna break it up. And to expose the fibers, you can just like pull and rip it, but I like just rolling it in a ball and crushing it with my thumbs, like this. I find that that's the best way. It's like screwing up a piece of paper. The more you screw it up like this in a ball, the more, scrunched up it will be the more creases the piece of paper will have so i like to just do that and then roll my thumbs over the top and that just helps really rough up those fibers i do it for about five minutes just so you can see a kind of before and after that's before I've roughed up the fibres of the grass, what it looks like. And that's after, you can see it's like a, it's much more f fluffy, really. More of a bird's nest. That will still take a flame uh, through a uh, bit of char cloth or a crumble fungus, but this will take it much easier and also burn for a bit longer because the fibres are much more dense, whereas they're a bit more spread out in this. So they burn quicker in this. So, made the bird's nest literally make a little hole in it as well like so keep it dry in the tinder bag you've seen this before recently i've got a flint st steel striker here the alex steel one the one i forged with alec and a piece of flint let's give it a test yep then I've got a char tin, which I keep my char cloth in. Uh, there's a good bit. I don't want loads, I just want the kind of fluffy bit. The fluffier part. That, that, that should do. Put it away, keep it all away from the damp. I also have a bit of dried birch bark here. Just in case, I picked some yesterday, just in case, uh, you know, to help get this going as well. So I'll put that birch bark over there.
by the way I have cleared an area here you can see and the, the ground's soaking so there won't be a chance of a forest fire I'll be clearing up afterwards too so don't fret yourselves people so I keep my cooking oil in a little test tube glass, vial, whatever you want to call it I won't need loads for this trip because we're cooking up some bacon what a surprise I love me the bacon Oh, she's hot We have thick cut bacon over here, by the way. It's like a European thing. Uh, I got a lot of questions about it. Oh, she's ready for some coffee. Bacon went down a treat. Round two of the coffee. And it's raining, it's starting to rain, it's smoking my eyes. So what I'm doing, because I'm getting near packing up now, I'm just putting all the coals towards the middle of the fire, any sticks that are part burning, putting them in the middle of the fire, uh, just to burn these off. I don't want to leave just chunks of burnt wood everywhere. So I'm sort of stoking it all into the middle, piling it up, blowing on it a bit, get the rest of these sticks burnt, and then uh, pack away the rest of the gear while this lot burns down. And then it should be ready by the end to... Uh, clear up and, and it should be cooled down enough.
So just to show you how the uh, quick release works, pull the stick out, pull the loop through, and then that's all slapped off, and ready to come around and pack away. This side's even easier to release. Literally just the one stick, pull it around and then it's done. Again, there's the ridge line on the top, and because it's a compression sack, just compress it all down. I'll have to lay this top out when I get home, because it would just get, we're not getting mould on it eventually. This is a five litre bag, I'm not sure. And there you go, nice and compact. The benefit of the tarp being so small is that I can just fit it in the backpack nice and easy. I've got the old axes, the old tools this side, and then I've got camera batteries and things like that. That needs to go in. It's in the bag. Cooks her. Got on top there. My sleeping bag just tucks under the straps here, the bottom straps of the bag. It's a bit of a fiddle because they don't unclip, they're sort of fixed, fixed loops. Sleeping bag just fits like that on the bottom. Then the saw I was using, I'll, I'll, let's put the fire out first. So fire's almost uh, pretty much burning out now. I'm just spread the coals and then I dig some holes all around the fire, around the edge. Oops. Dig some deep ones in the middle as well, because this is going to go right down the heat of this fire. So I don't want to get into the roots and burning tree roots. Nose holes. And then. Even any lift, leftover billy water and stuff, I'll go around the edge first. And then all over. I carry a backup water as well. So my cook system I keep in one of the pockets, the side pockets. And the way I stack it is I uh, my nesting cup first, drinking cup basically, which I just used. I've got the billy as well in the bag, but I did something different this morning. Then the stainless steel bottle, lid I usually put down the back. I've got a spork in there as well, that's the wooden spoon I was using just now. My knife, pre prep knife the side and this is a bottle hanger as well just pop that down the side there so it all fits in the side pockets nice and easy to access this side in the front I fit these down the main sort of pocket well that wind's getting strong and then this has the benefit of a front clip for my I would put my axe here but I just put the uh, the old axe in the bag for now, keep it dry, and then the folding saw clips on the front like that. We're good to go. And that's how you want it. Try to leave as little trace as possible. Oh, 
branch is coming down. <laughs> Guys, thanks so much for watching this video. I really appreciate it. Uh, if you did really enjoy it, feel free to give it a thumbs up. Maybe even hit the sub button if you want to and make sure that little bell notification is ticked. Got loads of bushcraft overnighters coming up as well. It's been great fun. I've had an absolute blast out here in the lovely English rain. And I'll see you soon, guys, in the next video. Doing the walking away shot. <laughs>